Hi, everyone. Welcome back to session four of our introduction to data visualization in Observable Plot course. Just a reminder, this is session four of four. So if you're hoping to get started with Observable Plot and you haven't watched the previous recordings, all of our videos for this course and notebooks and notebook keys are available so you can go back and look at those materials and get all caught up. So for session four, to start, I want to introduce our team who is here today to help. I am Allison. I am a data scientist advocate here at Observable. We also have behind the scenes Paul, the head of product education at Observable, and Henna, our social media manager. So I'll be watching questions, but also Paul and Henna will be behind the scenes to respond to questions and post links and help out. So a few logistics. As reminders, you can post questions in the chat here. You can also join our community Slack channel, and there's a specific channel for this course, um, the Intro to Observable Plot channel. If you want to save your work from today's lesson, you'll need an Observable account, and I'll show you how you can fork a notebook so that you can work in your own copy of it. You may want to have two screens set up side by side because most of today is going to be follow along activities. We'll all be typing code. And if you have it on one side of your screen or on another screen, then you'll be able to watch what I'm doing while also typing your own. But in addition to that, they're also in the follow along notebook, which we're going to share um, in just a bit once I get to, to the activities. There are show me buttons throughout the follow along notebook that you can click on and those will reveal the code solution for the activities I'm working on to make sure that everybody stays caught up. And finally, uh, the key slides and recordings will all be openly available even after the class is over. So you'll have access to all the materials. And it's good to see folks. Hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon or good evening. All right. Uh, so in sessions one, two, and three, we covered an introduction to the grammar of graphics, which is the framework for building charts layer by layer that observable plot follows. We've started building an understanding and skills for working with different marks. Those are the geometric shapes that we use to represent our data with different scales. So how are our actual abstract values in our data mapped onto our charts? Um, transforms, so things like binnings and groupings with reducers, so we can do a lot of reshaping of our data right within plot. And we've also been practicing a lot more ways that we can further customize our charts, um, do some faceting to break things up into small multiples, and added additional transforms uh, like moving windows and normalization and new marks. Like in session three, we made our first map in observable plot. So that's what we covered previously. And session four is going to be a really fun one because all we're doing in session four is adding some interactivity. We've already seen a preview of this because we've been adding tooltips to some of our charts, but we've really been using like the out of the box tip true option which adds some automatic um, nice tooltips on hover for existing channels that are in your chart. But we're going to keep building on our interact interactivity. Today, we're going to learn how we can add a crosshair mark and a pointer transform. That's going to be our first activity. Then we're going to start building custom tooltips, although we're just going to get a taste of this. Uh, you could do so much more with tooltips. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time on observable inputs, which are a really amazing way to make lightweight user interface elements or widgets that a viewer can interact with to control values that are tied to our visualizations so that our visualizations actually react immediately to what a user selects. And then at the end of the day today, I'm going to do a very quick course wrap up and share information about the assignment that you can complete and submit to get a certificate for this course. And we'll really look forward to seeing uh, the submissions from so many of you who have joined us. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, this is today's session is going to be almost entirely follow along activities and notebooks. Um, so the first activity that we're going to do is going to combine two things. We are going to start with a dot 
plot, a scatter plot, but we're going to add some information to it, which kind of livens it up with a little interactivity. And the first is we're going to add a crosshair mark. This reveals the X and Y values of an observation on hover um, and adds a nice perpendicular line to those axes so that you can see uh, kind of a little bit more fine tune what values of observations are. And we're also going to use a pointer transform. Transform um, is a way of quickly filtering a mark interactively so that only the point closest to your mouse to your pointer is actually rendered. And this gives us a really cool way to also add highlighting to whatever observation it is that we are closest to in our chart when we want to interact with it. So we're going to jump right in for activity one. So I'm going to switch over to the follow along notebook, which we will also share in the chat here. So there's the link to the follow along notebook. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to create your own copy of this in your own account so that your changes are saved. You can technically still edit this notebook without an account in Tinker Mode, but just keep in mind none of your changes will be saved. If you refresh the page, all of your um, nice edits will be lost. So you really want to be working in your own copy in your own account. And the way we do that is by clicking the fork button in the top right of that notebook. And then you can choose the workspace that you want to put it in. You might only have one. So I'm choosing fork. And then I can see that this has moved my copy over into my own account. So you should see your name up at the top, but still indicating that this was a fork of an existing notebook. So I'll give everyone just a minute to get started. And while I'm waiting to make sure that everybody is able to fork this notebook, um, just a few things. At the top of this notebook is a link to the YouTube playlist where all the recordings for this course are going to live. And it also has the link to the slides and the keys for each of the sessions if you need to go back and look at the materials. So the first activity that we're going to do is using a data set that we used in session three but we're going to add some interactivity to it. You'll notice that since the focus on, for today is on interactivity, all of the base plots are already created. So, so that we have time to really play with a few cool interactivity features and plot, all these base, base plots are already created and we are going to go ahead and just add different ways to make them interactive. So the World Bank data, just as a reminder, has information about country level metrics. Um, so for things like CO2 emissions, GDP, life expectancy, um, there's also some categorical variables like the income group designated by the World Bank and the region. So we're going to be using this for the first example, and then we are going to um, actually return to this data set later on. Okay, so the base plot that's created here is a static scatter plot of GDP versus life expectancy for each of the countries in that World Bank data set uh, from the year 2010. So this is only filtered to 2010. We'll see later on that we have ways of exploring multiple years. So we'll add an input where we can do that. But you can see if you hover over any of those observations, there's no tooltip, there's no interactivity. This is purely a static chart. But we might want to ask questions about like, well, what is the value for this dot representing a country's GDP and life expectancy? And what is that country's name if I hover? So that's what we're going to add next. So the first thing that I'm going to add is a pointer transform that allows me to create a new dot mark. But the pointer transform is filtering to only a subset of the data closest to where I'm hovering, to where my pointer is. And that means that gives me a tool to be able to highlight points as I hover near them. So let's go ahead and do that. So like I was saying, this is actually going to be a plot mark. We're still going to add a dot. And this could be before or after the existing dot. For simplicity, I'm going to do it right after. So I have a comma between my marks. Um, as a reminder, if this structure looks unfamiliar, make sure you go back to the plot documentation. It's wonderful. Or to the uh, tutorials or um, lessons previously in this class to understand the structure of initializing the plot, 
the marks that we add to represent our data, um, and then the different scales that we can control. But here I have a comma between my marks, so I'm going to add another dot mark. Using that same data, which is stored as WB2010, and then I need to give this mark what my different channels are. Um, so in this case, along the X scale, I'm going to still plot the same thing. I'm going to plot GDP. On the Y scale, I'm going to plot life expectancy. And along, and then actually just as an example, I'm going to say I just want the fill color to be red. Now, if I just do this as is, then what I'm going to see is suddenly I only see red points, right? And that's because I just have two identical layers layered on top of each other. The only difference being the topmost layer, the points are red, but they're perfectly overlapping. But this isn't what I want. I don't want all my points to be red. I want a point to show up in red when it's the closest point that I'm hovering to. And that's what the pointer transform allows us to do really quickly. So I'm going to add this transform around those options that I have for this dot mark. So I'm going to add this plot dot pointer transform. Make sure you add that last parentheses at the end. And as soon as I've added that, what this is doing is this is adding a filter automatically so that only this layer is showing a dot when it's the closest point next to where I'm hovering. So now I see my gray points from that initial plot dot layer, but you can see when you hover, now you can see that the point closest to where I'm hovering is being highlighted. So this is a cool way to actually show precisely like or highlight a point as you're looking over the data. Let's make it a little bit more obvious what we're highlighting because we can change the options for this pointer transformed dot mark, just like we would with other mark options. Um, so we can expect, for example, that we can change the opacity. Maybe I'll change the opacity to 0.6. And maybe I'll actually make the radius of this pointer transformed dot a little bit larger than the uh, original gray point. So maybe I'll say, I want the radius to be 8. And now you can see that this is really highlighting the observations that I'm closest to. Now, a cool thing that we might want to do is we might want to add a tooltip that gives us information about the um, point that we're actually hovering closest to. Like right now, right? We don't actually have information about what the thing is that we are hovering over. For example, it might be really nice to know what country that is. Like what is this highest country that has this kind of highest coordinate for GDP and life expectancy, for example, or for, for life expectancy and second highest for GDP. So let's go ahead and add a tooltip for that. The way that we can add a tooltip out of the box is a reminder is we can add tip true, which is pretty nice. And if you're wondering if you just saw my code reformat, you can use option shift F and that will automatically um, reformat your plot code to have this nice vertical structure, which is a little bit more readable and easier for debugging. So I've added the um, so I've added this tip mark. Um, so you can see now I have a tip, but this is showing life expectancy and GDP. This is an important thing for tooltips, is that. If you are adding a tooltip, the defaults that are going to get added are existing channels. So existing channels here, remember channels are options where the value is based on a variable. Otherwise, the options are called constants. So here, if I have selected these different pieces, um, so here, if I've selected these different pieces, maybe I just want it to say the country name, for example. I can update this. There's a number of ways I can update this, actually. Uh, but one way is to specify a title option. And then within backticks, I can say what I want to actually add to that. So this is within a little arrow function. And I can say, I want this to contain a little string that has the country name property accessed from each of those observations. 
And then if you hover, you can see that now you have these different values. So this title um, option can be one nice way to customize what's in your tooltips because you can put whatever you want in here. I could say like country as the label, for example, and then you can see that the tooltip now has country and then the country name. You could also add a line break and do something like GDP and then access the GDP value. Um, so you have control over what shows what shows up there. You could format this using like D3 formatting functions for the numbers, uh, but you can really control what shows up in, in the tooltip. This is one way of doing that. There are other ways that you could also update the formatting here. Okay, so now we have a chart. Oh, is there a way to dim all other points with the point transform? That's a good question. I'll show this one just because it's a good question. Is there a way to dim all the other points with a point transform? Um, I want to say I'm sure there is. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what the what the code would look like though, but I'll try to follow up in the Slack channel to see if you can simultaneously subset to only be showing what the pointer is next to and that that also is doing something to the things that aren't selected. It's a really good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll follow up. Okay, so now we've added to our chart, we've added these cool highlights for points. We've also added uh, the country name. So for example, now I can see that this country that I was interested in that has, you know, the second or third highest GDP and it looks like the close to the highest life expectancy is Japan. So I can really start checking out like different locations that look like they're of interest to me. But one more thing that can be useful is to actually show the uh, values on the X and Y axis. So we could add grid lines that might become a little bit overwhelming, but we might also for each point we hover near, we might actually want to show like, well, what are the corresponding X and Y values? And for that, we can use the crosshairs mark, which is a really cool one. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add an additional mark here. So remember, all of our marks are within this marks section of my plot code. Um, and I already have two marks. First is my gray dots. Second is my pointer transformed red larger marks that show up on hover. So I'm going to add a comma after that second dot mark. And then here I'm going to add my plot crosshair mark. So here I'm going to again say what the data is, WB2020. I want the x-axis and y-axis um, channels to be the same. So x is still GDP, uh, y is life expectancy, and I'm just going to do this for now. So this is like the only thing that I'm going to include here. And if I hover now, what you can see is not only do I still have that pointer transform, but that crosshairs mark is automatically adding these perpendicular lines and revealing the value on the X and Y axis. So you can see that this gives me another way to see more information about each of these individual observations on hover, which is pretty nice. All right, I mean, I feel like this is this is so cool uh, that like it's it's really only been a few minutes, but we've already added interactivity actually in in three different ways, right? With a tooltip that you can customize, with a pointer transform that allows you to highlight points on hover, and with this crosshairs mark that you can use. Um, and there are like many variations of this. So definitely if you want to see more examples of how this is implemented, for example, so that you could like hover over time series data and then have the value revealed like up at the top of the plot, definitely check out the observable plot documentation um, for the interactivity section where the crosshairs mark and the pointer transform is featured because there's a lot of great examples there. Okay, so I'm gonna hop back to slides 
And now I'm just going to do a quick example of custom tool tips next. Um, so we've been using that built-in tip true option. I just showed that you can additionally add a title option where you can control what's shown there. But there are a few other ways that you might want to use tool tips. Um, and one way that I think is really useful is to actually add static annotations, but with that nice tooltip formatting that comes along with it. You could also do this, for example, with a text mark um, that's at a certain location, right? In session two or three, maybe it was session three. In one of our last two sessions, we used uh, a text mark in combination with a select transform so that you could select if you wanted that text to be, for example, placed at the last series or the last value in a series or at the maximum value of a series. So you can use uh, the text mark here. I'm going to show how we can also use the um, tip mark to actually uh, create a static annotation on a chart, but with that tip formatting. Um, so one thing that I think is, is useful to point out, especially now that we've seen the pointer transform, is that what the uh, that tip true is actually doing under the hood is a combination of the tip mark. And that's what's adding that nice like text bubble and some of the auto formatting that's within those tool tips that we add can add automatically. That's actually a tip mark combined with a pointer transform. So that's what makes it only show up as you're hovering over the closest value is that pointer transform. And then the tip is what's actually uh, making it appear in that nice formatting that we see. Um, so this gives you a way to have a little bit more control over like the combinations of tip and, and pointer, for example. But we can also see from this like that you don't have to have plot tip used in combination with a pointer transform. You can use it on its own, but then it's not going to have that interactive hover uh, behavior. So let's see an example where we customize a few of these things and add some static annotation too with that tool tip. So I'm going to go down as a reminder, you can click on the show me button um, where you can see what I just did in the first example, plus a few extra things. Um, but let's go ahead and return to our chart that we had started building a couple days ago, showing stock prices for Apple, Google, or Alphabet, and Tesla. So we have time series data for daily closing prices for these stocks over the years, um, but these are daily observations and the closing prices in US dollars. And once again, we can see that there is no interactivity here. I don't see anything when I happen when I try to hover over each of these points, but it might be really nice to actually add information either as like static markers for points of interest or dynamic tooltips where I could learn more. And those could be like the crosshairs like we just added um, or other variations of it. But we're going to go ahead and just play for a minute with tooltips to see what else it can do if we just work within that plot tip mark without um, without that, that uh, pointer transform. So the first thing is, as a reminder, we can just do tip true here. Um, so keep in mind when you do that, this is... <laughs> This is great. You get an out of the box tooltip. As a reminder, though, what this contains by default are only existing channels. So it's only revealing the value of variables uh, that have been mapped onto these different scales. So it's showing uh, the symbol because that's mapped onto the color. It's showing the closing price because that's my Y axis channel and the date because that's my X axis channel. But there actually is more information in that stocks data set. There's information, for example, about the opening price that we might want to add. So one thing is even if, so you could add that with title, like you could, like we did in the last example, you could add a title. But another thing you can do is you can just specify additional channels. So I can just say there are more channels that I want you to recognize. And then I'm going to say, how do I want this to show up? in my tip, and then what is the actual name of the property that I'm pulling a value from. Um, so what this is going to do is even though that open price isn't actually associated with any 
visual component, like it's not an, an existing channel that I already had for my chart. Because I've put it within this channels option, now I can see that open is also showing up there. Um, and there's also options for, for formatting uh, the tip mark too. So in the documentation, you can see that within tip, instead of just having tip true, you can have tip and then format and then have your format options for things like um, the numeric formatting and the label for that tool tip that you want to appear, which is really nice. So the next thing that I want to show is uh, just as an example and to build our understanding of the tip mark is I want to show how we can use the tip mark for static annotations, uh, which can be really useful when you're trying to provide context or when you want to indica indicate um, important thresholds of values uh, to really like have a user have some baseline for comparison or be able to focus really quickly on a specific thing that's happened. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to, for each of these different series, so for the Apple stocks, the Google stocks, and the Tesla stocks, we are going to add a static tooltip that is at or pointing to the maximum value that that stock has reached for its closing um, price across the entire series that we have here. And that's going to be a separate mark. So that's going to be a separate tip mark. So I'm going to say plot.tip. And if I did want to create an interactive tooltip, I would combine this with the pointer transform here. But that's not what I'm going to do. Instead, I'm going to say I actually want to use the stocks data. And let's make something uh, really horrible first. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say plot tip. And I'm going to give it the same X and Y channels. So X is going to be based on the date property value, Y is getting pulled from the close property value and the stroke is going to be the symbol. And that's the symbol is the property name, um, Apple, Google, or Tesla. Uh, so let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Um, so I see that uh, nothing is happening currently because it took a while because what this is doing is a complete nightmare. This is creating a tooltip at every single value of my observation. And the tooltip is technically right, but this is not what I want to do. What I want to do is just have this placed at a single location, which is the maximum value. Now I'm just hoping that I'm not like shattering my computer. But this is something that we had learned um, previously is we can use the select transform, right? to only have this appear at a certain subset of the data, like the last value in the data or the maximum amount of the maximum about amount for X and Y. So that's what we're going to use here. Instead of just saying place a tip at every single one of these values, which is clearly a bad idea. Instead, I'm going to wrap these options in a select transform where what I'm selecting is the max Y value. So here and make sure you have that closing parentheses. So now my options are wrapped within that select transform, which means that this is only going to happen at the maximum value of Y for each of these different series. So if I run this, then we can breathe a sigh of relief because now that tooltip is only showing up for each of these series, indicating the maximum value that it reaches. Um, one thing to highlight here is this is showing up for each of these different series because we have this channel for stroke indicating that there's this additional dimension that I want to recognize groups within. If I get rid of this and just have uh, select max date and close, that's going to look at the entire data set and only find the maximum for the whole data set, which is why now that static annotation only shows up for that highest value for uh, for for Tesla stocks. Um, but because I have that uh, because I have that because I have that additional stroke channel based on symbol, then it recognizes that there's these different groups within that symbol category. And now it's being shown for each of those. Okay. <laughs> 
I like these comments. Yes, Plot has gotten a ton of new functionality and truly like more every day, like every day I learn something new and awesome that I'm like, or sometimes it's not even new. Sometimes it's just new to me and awesome. But like, yeah, the pace at which new features are being rolled out is so awesome. Um, so definitely keep an eye on like the plot issues. It's all open. You can see what folks are working on and, and upvote features. Uh, our, our team loves to hear about like what people would find most valuable. It does look like a Windows theme and observable with all those tool tips. <laughs> okay, so um, so we can see that we can use these as we still have my interactive tool tip, right? Uh, but I also have added tool tips that just show the maximum values for each series, and those are static. Those aren't combined with a pointer transform, which is why they're just staying in one place, not just on hover. The other thing that's cool is that um, you can change uh, some of the look and formatting for the tips. For example, if you wanted to really highlight these, or in this case, just make them look really obnoxious, I can say I want the fill color for that tip to be yellow. Uh, you could do a bit more customizing on this. Um, you can also change the anchoring. So notice that here, the defaults that has been selected is that the anchor is in the top right but you can control that. One thing that I think is like so awesome about the uh, tool tips on hover is that they automatically change the anchor so that the entire tool tip uh, is still visible as you get to the margins of your visualization. Like, I, th I feel like it's a thing that like is hard to notice, but actually really magical <laughs> is like right now over here, this is top right anchored. But over here, it's bottom left anchored so that I can still see the entire tooltip. So that's a little bit of magic uh, under the hood that I don't have to think about. But if you ever do want to manually change um, the, the anchoring for these points, you can use the anchor option. So here I could say, for example, I want the anchor to actually be right. And I have to spell anchor correctly. And then I'll see that now the anchor is just directly on the right hand side. But there's also top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left, top, bottom and left. So you have options for where in the corners or um, straight on the sides of this rectangle that you actually want those to be. So I think tip is um, a really wonderful and uh, quickly evolving um, and versatile feature for both interactive uh, tooltips on hover that you can customize and also for static annotation to highlight things or give context to your visualizations. All right, so I'm going to hop back to slides. And now we are going to get into the main event for today's interaction, um, which is observable inputs. So observable inputs are these lightweight user interface elements, sometimes you'll hear those called widgets, that allow users to make selections. So these are things like radio buttons, or check boxes, or a slider bar, or a date selector, or a text box, or many other things that you can think of. Buttons, like the ways that you can interact with uh, web pages. And observable inputs makes it one, really quick to create those things, and two, really quick to connect the current selection value to elements of your chart to make it interactive. And that's what we're gonna be doing for the rest of the day today is actually seeing a number of different ways that we can add interactivity using observable inputs. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch. No, actually, I'm going to do a little overview and slides of inputs. Um, oh, I see the I saw a comment that the link to the slides is broken. So let me see if I can try just pulling from the URL that I'm looking at in case people need the slides here. Um, so let's see if that link works for folks who want the slides. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I see a question. Uh, can you make each of the three tooltip anchors at different locations? Ooh, that's a good question. Haven't tried it. Not sure. You could absolutely do it by making them different marks, right? But that might be a little bit redundant if you want them all at the same location. Um, 
I wonder if there's a way to uh, change the um, like the domain uh, for the anchor, but I'm not sure. So yeah, that's a that's a great question. Okay, so here um, I'm going to go ahead and go through inputs a bit. So. For interactivity with inputs, we're going to follow this pattern where we are going to do three steps. We're going to create the input. That's the first thing, like add a radio button to our notebook. The second thing is we are going to customize that from the defaults that are added to actually match our data and what we want it to show. And the third is that once we've created that input and give it a name, we're going to call the name of that input, which also stores the current value of that input and use that in our visualizations to refer to the value of that dynamic input rather than to an absolute value. So I wanna show an example of what this can look like and then we'll actually jump into two examples with this. So here's an example of what an input can look like and we'll create these from code snippets. So here we have a view of piece that both displays an interactive element, our widget, and it stores the current value. So the current user selection. We can give it a name. So in fact, we have to give it a name to store the values that are selected. And then this is where our actual input is created. So there's a bunch of built-in types. This input creates radio buttons. There's also inputs checkbox, in puts text, inputs date, for example. This will create radio buttons. And then the first element within, or the first argument within that inputs radio is what are the different choices that a person has to choose from in that radio button? And then you can give it a label, you can give it a start value or other options. But what's stored here is as a person, so this is what this actually looks like, this created radio button using that code. What happens is as a person, as a user would select different choices from this input, the actual stored value in this case of this variable named pick species changes to be the current selection. So the current value of pick species is the string gen2. If a user switched to a deli, then the current value of pick species would be the string a deli. So this gives us a way to have like a dynamic variable that we can refer to in our plot code. So what we're going to do then is because we have this changeable by the user radio button storing the current value of the selection, is we can then use that to customize what's actually showing up in our chart. So in this case, this is saying, I want to have the fill color not be a constant and not be dependent on like a value in the data. I want to have the fill color if the species matches the value of species. So in this case, it would say this is asking if the species, if the species value matches Gen 2, then I want the color of my point to be red. Otherwise, I want the color of my point to be gray. So this is called the ternary operator. This is just a shorthand way in JavaScript of creating an if-else statement. So in this case, again, this is saying, asking the question, does the species call a match pick species? Then I want the color to be red. Otherwise, I want the fill color to be gray. So that gives us a tool to highlight individual species because wherever whatever selected is going to be in red and the other species are going to be in gray. Let's go ahead and try it out. So I'm going to hop over to the notebook for the rest of the day. So we're going to create first. Um, first, let's take a look at what we're looking at. Again, the base plot is already created and then we're just going to make it interactive. So this is a bubble chart that shows the relationship between GDP and CO2 emissions. Um, and it's for all years in the World Bank data. So you can actually track here for like the, the trails of countries as they move many of them towards greater GDP and often slightly towards higher CO2 emissions. Not all the case, but oftentimes. So how can we add interactivity to this? 
we're going to do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is that we're going to allow a, allow a user to select a specific region. And the second is we're going to allow a user to select a specific year. So we're actually going to add two different inputs here to do that for us. The first we're going to add is a drop down menu. So if I go over to my add cell menu and start typing in drop down, then I'll see that there's an option for an input for drop down menu. So I'm going to select that and it automatically puts placeholder code here for me. So if you run this as is, you can see that this is a drop down menu where I have only A and B as options because those are the only two things in this first argument, this array of values. We don't want the choices to be A and B. We want the choices to be programmatically selected as the different unique regions that exist within this World Bank data. So the way that that's going to look is I'm going to, instead of having just A and B here, I'm going to create an array from all the different regions, all the different values of regions in that WB data using the map method. And then I'm going to add a unique true option to make sure that they each only show up once in my dropdown menu. Otherwise, each of the regions would show up every single time it shows up in the data set. So they would be repeated a bunch of times. So here I'm going to say WB map. This is iterating over each of those objects in my WB array of objects. For each of those objects, I want to access the region value. But again, if I just ran this, this is going to get a very long drop down menu of many duplicated values. So I'm going to also add an argument unique true within those options within the curly braces so that they each only show up once in my drop down menu. And so now I can see that I have a drop down menu only with each of the regions from that data set shown once. Cool. So I've created my drop down. But as a reminder, like this is not currently connected to anything, but it is actually storing a value and it's storing it to this name. So instead, I'm going to make this more meaningful. I'm going to call this pick region to make it a little bit more descriptive. And what's actually happening under the hood, just to preview, you don't have to write this part, but just to show you what's happening is it's storing the current value of that drop down menu. So if I select something else, Notice that the value of pick region is also being automatically updated. So that gives me a tool that I can use then to control what's showing up in my chart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that within my chart, only the subset for that region that I've selected is appearing in my chart at any one time. So I'm going to scroll down to my plot code, and this is where I'm connecting my input value to an element of my chart. So the way that I'm going to do that here is with filter. So within this role bank data, um, sorry, within this plot code, within my options for this dot mark, I'm going to add an additional option to create a filter right within observable plot. You could absolutely do that outside of observable plot too, if you wanted to create the subset outside of observable plot. I'll do it within observable plot here using that ternary operator that we saw, where I'm going to say for each region, for each observation, does the region value match that pick region input? And if it does, then I want this to actually show up. But if it doesn't, then I don't want anything to show up. So actually, we don't need the ternary operator at this point. We're not doing an else. So I'm just doing this filter asking, does the region match the current value of pick region? If yes, keep it. If not, then it shouldn't be in this current view that we have of the chart. So now you can see that this is a reduced proportion of the values from the original data set. And that's because only values that match this condition where the region property value is the current choice for pick region are actually showing up. So here, if I switch my drop down menu, then 
then I can see that this is changing the subset of my data that's actually showing up. So here, now I have an interactive chart showing these different subsets based on region. Now, just to show an example of a slider, um, because they, these can be really useful, let's also add an input based on years in this data set, because each of these trails kind of tracks a country's change in that GDP and CO2 emissions coordinate over time. So let's go ahead and also create an input for year where we can scroll through years and only have values show up to the selected year on that slider. So I'm gonna, again, from the add cell menu, I'm gonna start typing in slider. I'm going to choose slider. And then I'm gonna go ahead and update this using values from my data. First, I'm going to plug in my computer so it doesn't die on us all. Okay, so <laughs> back. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make this input that uses years of the data. So to do that, I'm gonna use D3 extent. That gets me an array of the minimum to the maximum value in a property. In this case, that's gonna be from the WB data set, the year. Um, from, so from the year property, what are the minimum and maximum values? So you can see if you run that, then you are accessing the minimum to maximum values. The other way you could do that here is if you just knew this range from 1997 to 2021, you could alternatively just say range from 1997 to 2001. So it's doing the same thing. Um, but here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change the label. So I'm gonna say like pick year. And now I can see that I have this custom input and I can also change this name to pick year. So it's a little bit more obvious what this is doing. So now what I can do is I can add an additional condition, right? I've made this variable that changes in value based on the user selection. So right now pick year's value is 1998, but if I move it to 2000, then the year is 2000. And we can connect that to an element of our chart. So for example, if I'm going to also say, actually, I want this to filter um, to only include where the region matches, and I actually want the year to be less than or equal to the pick year value, that means that the only things that are going to show up are the years uh, in the trajectory that are below the current selection year. So again, but doing the same steps, we're creating an interactive widget that is storing the value of the current user selection. And then we can call that dynamic, uh, that, that changeable variable name anywhere in our chart so that it's going to update automatically. So now that I've said it has to match both the region and the year has to be less than or equal to the year, then you can see that now you can kind of track as these values changes, mine's jumping quite a bit. Oh, I put 2001, no wonder, this should be 2021. It's like, why is this not showing anything? Then you can see these tracks kind of form um, for each of these different countries. You could add tooltips or labels with like select last. So you could actually see the country name, for example. And also you can change this to be the different regions. So we've added these multiple inputs now uh, for region and year using a dropdown and a numeric slider to add interactivity to this chart. And you could customize this way more in the key. I also added like an opacity ternary operator to change the opacity based on whether it's the current year or previous year. Um, so there's a bunch of ways that you could further customize this to make this a little bit more readable. You could also add an automa automated play button, for example. So you could just press play and like watch these bubbles progress. Okay, so that's one example. Let's do one more. So let's do one more example again with uh, two different inputs. But in this case, we're gonna use a radio button and we're gonna use a checkbox. So in total, we're gonna already have used four different inputs just from today's activities, which is cool. Um, but hopefully what, what comes across is like, 
that even if you're using different inputs, the process of doing this is the same. You create your input, you customize it based on and for your data. That input stores the current selection value, <clears throat> and then you can use that to refer to that dynamic value to adjust any elements in your chart that you want to change as the user changes their selection. That process stays the same. So let's do that for our final example. So we're going to do an input form um, with a checkbox and radio buttons. And this is using information on power plants in the United States from the US uh, EIA, the Energy and Information Administration. And what I've already created is a little bar chart. So if you scroll down, I've created a little not dynamic, not interactive bar chart that shows for different states, in this case, just the top 10. This shows uh, kind of the, the breakdown of energy production um, or energy production capacity for the different power plants in that state by source. So just to make this a little bit clear, if I do color and then add legend true, um, then this shows us that these are for like total coal capacity, total natural gas capacity, total oil capacity for the power plants across each state. This uses the bar X mark with the group transform that we talked about in session two. But maybe this is too much, right, for a user. Maybe we just want to say, like, you know what would be really helpful is if I could just look at <clears throat> the power source that I'm interested in and just compare that between the states that I'm interested in. So we're going to create some inputs that allow a user to do that. The first one is going to be a a uh, checkbox that lets a user pick multiple states. You can pick one or more states. And the second is going to be a radio button where they can pick the power source. So let's go ahead and create these. So I, again, right above this chart, I'm going to add a new checkbox. So I'm going to use a checkbox input. So make sure here you choose the checkbox input option, not toggle or checkbox table but I'm gonna choose checkbox box input. And again, if I just run this, I can see checkboxes are created. This allows you to store an array of multiple selected values. But here, instead of A and B, I want this to be all of my states. So again, using the map method, we're gonna access all the state names, but only have them each show up once. So we're gonna add that unique true option again. So here, I'm gonna say this data is called plants, so I'm going to map to iterate through each of them and return the output of a function. That function is I just want to access the state. But if I just use this, then this, every state, every time it shows up, would show up once, which is going to be way too much. So I'm going to add this unique true option to make sure they each only show up once. So let's go ahead and run that. So now only each of my states is only showing up one time. But there are a couple of other things that I might want to do. For example, it might be nice if these were in alphabetical order. I can go ahead and just add to the end of this plants.map piece, make sure it's after the parentheses. I can just add the sort method, and then that will automatically make it alphabetical, which is really nice. And another thing that I might want to do is, because if nothing is selected by default, nothing's going to show up in our chart. So I'm going to go ahead, instead of having the value be A, which doesn't exist here, I'm going to say, I want the default to be that Alabama, Alaska, and Arizona are all selected by default. Now I can see that those are selected by default, but I could, you know, I could, I could change this up um, so that if there anything else is selected. But those are just the defaults. But I can change and deselect whatever I want. And this is going to store a vector of all the selected value, or sorry, an array of all the selected values. So let's go ahead and use that to limit what states are actually showing up in this chart. So I'm again going to use a filter to do that. So I'm going to say within this plants bar chart, um, I'm going to have actually just a statement here where I filter this to filter the data itself. So I'm going to say, again, instead of having a separate filter piece, I'm just going to say filter this data 
so that this is actually what's going into the chart, right? I'm going to say filter so that the pick states, I don't think I changed that up here. I still have this called checkboxes. Let's change this to pick states. So I've changed this to pick states. So I'm saying if the pick states array, that's my array of the different checkboxes that are selected, includes, so this is a JavaScript method to ask, does it include these values? The state property value, that means like, if the state of an observation is one of those that's selected, then I actually want to have that show up in this chart. Then that's part of my filtered data set. So let's go ahead and see what happens if we just run this. Now we'll see that this data has been filtered to only include the different values that show up if the state has been selected. So here, as I select different states, now I can see that different state combinations are showing up and being compared. And I could also, although I'm going to stop for time, if you look in the key, I also show an example of adding an additional radio button where you could also filter to only select a specific energy source. So you could just compare, for example, oil production capacity for power plants <clears throat> across states so that it might make it a little bit more manageable. Or maybe this is what you want. Maybe you actually want to be able to compare uh, the mix of different um, power plant energy sources across the different states. So this could be the endpoint that you wanted. So the takeaway here for inputs is there are a bunch of different inputs. Like I said, dates, text, um, long text input forms, radios, checkboxes, sliders, toggles, buttons, et cetera. So many. If you just look, if you just like look in the ad cell menu and type in inputs, you'll see that these are all of the built-in ones and you can create your own. So there's other inputs that other folks have created that you can look at or import or make your own. Um, but the process for using them to update a chart really should feel similar. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, which I think is really empowering. You create the widget and you customize it for your data. You give it a name that stores the value of the current user selection. And then you can use the name of that thing that stores those dynamic values as something you reference to, to update an element in your observable plot chart, which I think is super nice. All right, I'm gonna hop back to slides to wrap things up. Um, so this course was only a total of four sessions and four hours, and we covered a lot from the foundations of the grammar of graphics to marks to represent data to channels so that we can change how things appear based on different variable values, um, scales, so how our abstract values from our data map onto different aspects of our chart area, transform so we can do some reshaping right within our plot code, Faceting, we've added and customized tooltips, we added a new crosshair mark, and we have learned how we can use this system for creating inputs to make our charts interactive. Um, so we covered a lot in these four sessions and uh, really excited for folks to continue learning Observable Plot with and alongside us. I continue learning, like I said, every day. Um, for this course, uh, you are encouraged and we will be excited to see submissions for the course certificate that you can earn. Um, we're going to share that course and submission instruction. Actually, cool. OK, the assignment's already there. It's ready to go. We're also going to be emailing it and posting it on the Slack channel, but it's also in the chat here. So you have the assignment. It has all of the instructions in it. It's three tasks. Um, there's some like minimum requirements, but I encourage you to like, you know, try and build whatever you want. So feel free to get creative uh, as long as those minimum requirements are satisfied. I think there's a lot you can do with the data set. Those assignments are due for the certificate by the end of day, wherever you are in the world, um, midnight your time on Monday, November 6th. I guess that's technically 11.59 p.m on Monday, November 6th for you, so that night. Uh, read instructions carefully. Make sure that you update your notebook listing. You'll be forking the assignment notebook that we just shared. 
to make your own copy, make sure before you submit the link, there's a form that you'll submit it to that's in the assignment post. Make it public unlisted so that we can uh, actually see it so we can evaluate your cool work. And then we're going to do a review and we'll send out your certificates by email by Friday, November 10th. So we will look forward to seeing your submissions and sending your certificates back to you. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us for this course. Uh, I'm excited to keep learning. The observable plot documentation is amazing. Um, and make sure that you also join us in the observable community Slack where you can see examples that people share, ask for help, um, and have conversations about exciting new observable plot uh, skills and concepts that we can all learn together. So thanks everyone for joining. Looking forward to see your submissions and we'll see you again soon at next events. Bye everybody.